have the power to change. Was there an Adam? Was there an Eve? Or did we evolve from what we conceived? Either way, we got what we needed when the sun shone down on the Garden of Eden. Don't you know we're gonna have a solitopia, solitopia, solitopia? Don't you know we're gonna have a solitopia all over God's green world? Well, we bit the apple and the garden was lost, and so we had to work to pay the cost. And so we went digging into the ground and started to burn many things we found. But oh, yeah. Don't you know we're gonna have to burn too many things. Too many things we found. That's the wonderful Dar Williams singing with Pete Seeger and David Burns, the Solar Topia song. We got a, uh, a powerful show today. I do want to start Mark Ashey with us, the publisher and founder of Reader Supported News. I am. All right. Good to hear from you, Mark. Where are you, by the way? I am in Northern California, near the Russian River, uh, right. in an did. area where that was affected by the recent uh, fires. Oh, well, you can thank PG&E for that. I hope to God we break I, that I have something up. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, before we get into this, I want to compliment you on Reader Supported News. It's a great site. Uh, you've done a great thing starting it. I know you started uh, Truth Out before that. Um, you got a heck of a track record, and uh, Reader Supported News is uh, my favorite website, and I'm glad that you're uh, rolling along with it. So thank you for your great work. I, Fantastic, you Harvey. Piece, well, you do have a piece up today um, uh, complimenting Congress, and I don't want to let this one go by on uh, having finally passed an anti-lynching bill. Uh, it only took uh, two centuries. Uh, I, right. I have done a lot of reading on the New Deal, and uh, the um, this was in the 1930s. There was a tremendous fight over an anti-lynching bill, and Franklin Roosevelt wouldn't support it because he had too many um, Southern white Democrats that he was beholden to. And uh, so it's taken all these years, uh, uh, almost 5,000 lynchings in this country, and you have a piece by Jack Crosby up there, uh, talking about uh, finally the Congress has passed an anti-lynching bill. So I just got one thing to say to the Congress, Mazel Tov, it's about time. Uh, I did watch last night, by the way, the Spike Lee movie. Have you seen this one, Mark, uh, The Black Klansman? Um, it's quite amazing. I did not work. see it. Yeah, well, it's definitely worth seeing. So you, uh, among your many uh, talents, have been writing regularly at, at um, uh, Reader Supported News, and you recently had a piece about uh, Trump and espionage. And um, uh, I'm, right, I'm reminded of another great title from the 1960s of a book called None Dare Call It Treason. Uh, why don't you expound, tell us a bit more about your thinking on, on espionage uh, when it comes to Donald Trump. Well, what we're really looking at here is we have, I, I think we'd really like to know what the level of cooperation is between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. To what extent is he providing aid and assistance? To what extent was he remunerated? If he was remunerated and there were understandings that he would do certain things that were contrary to the national security interests of the United States of America, then, yeah, he's basically dancing with espionage. Well, here's, uh, here's a, your quote here. Uh, espionage basically, as you put it, is willfully compromising U.S. national security to serve the interests of a hostile foreign power. <clears throat> Are you saying that this is what Donald Trump has done with Vladimir Putin? Well, I said in the title that I said espionage is not out of the question. Here's the problem. Everybody wants to know what Robert Mueller knows. But I think... If you if you take a look at the trajectory of his investigation, the people he's talking to, and what we know on the public record in what terms of what Donald Trump was engaged in, his financial transactions, his contact with the Russians, his desire to build a big project in Russia, 
Um, all these things happened at about the same time, and there were avid, there were discussions, uh, pointed discussions in terms of um, uh, re- uh, re- removing sanctions or relieving sanctions, and things that would remunerate both uh, Vladimir Putin and his uh, associates. So well, as of uh, today, now, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, at the end it of the turns day, out it, as though it, it, would you? What you're wondering there is, is there a quid pro quo? And we don't know that yet. But sure, I mean, he was definitely sick as... Yeah. If Trump got paid off to do any of this stuff by Putin, what's the difference, Mark Ash, uh, between uh, uh, espionage and treason? I mean, Treason is a very, very, very limited... Um, treason, there aren't any, really any, even any laws against treason. Uh, treason is not, there are no statutes, federal statutes against treason. Treason is a provision in the Constitution. And it's a very, very narrow, you have to give aid and comfort to an enemy at a time of war. Um, this is a very narrow uh, provision. Uh, it, Absolutely. Uh, people have been uh, prosecuted for treason, but it hasn't happened uh, since, the, uh, since the Second World War. Um, I, there really isn't any way to define Donald Trump's contacts with Vladimir Putin. Um, we are not at war with Russia, so you really can't define it as treason. Espionage is what almost everyone who effectively provides a material um, uh, action. It could be uh, information, it could be documents, it could be a number of things, but a material action uh, to a hostile foreign power, um, uh, particularly when there's remuneration. That is to say, I was the, 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 the individual was paid X amount of dollars, and provided X documents to foreign power and was caught and tried. That's espionage. Donald Trump is doing favors for Vladimir Putin. Absolutely. Um, Are those exclusively within the scope of his powers of the presidency? Or has he deliberately um, used the powers of the presidency to go outside of what he knows to be uh, U.S. national interest, security interest, and was he remunerated? If he was remunerated and he did those things knowingly, willfully, against the advice of all of his advisors, you're dancing with espionage. Yes, it meets, it meets the guidelines. Okay, uh, we're talking with Mark Ash. By the way, we're going to be joined, and Mark, I hope you'll stay with us if you can. Uh, at 20 sure. minutes after the hour, we're going to be joined by Medea Benjamin of Code Pink. To talk I know about the, uh, 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 good, uh, the, uh, the Syria and uh, Lebanon votes, uh, 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 Yemen votes in the Congress. And at 40 minutes afterwards, we'll be joined by Jody Evans, also of Code Pink, talk about the Green sure. New Deal and those uh, situations uh, that are starting to arise with uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the, and the, the push for a major uh, reconstruction of our infrastructure around renewable energy. Uh, we're with Mark Ash now, the founder and publisher of uh, uh, Reader Supported News. Uh, Mark, I have written on uh, Reader Supported News um, about uh, various aspects of Trump's uh, uh, financial history with uh, Putin. Now, we know uh, without any doubt that uh, Trump's entire financial uh, <laughs> House of Cards, let's put it that way, has been dependent on Russian billionaire money, money laundering in particular, since the 1980s. And um, uh, that, uh, that Trump really, in, in strict financial terms, is owned by Vladimir Putin. I do not think that's an overstatement. So, um, Well, uh, I, comes- I think there are some instances that are better documented than others. Certainly the sale of the house in Florida that was valued at $45 million and sold for close to $80 million uh, and, and is now, some, some years later, been appraised or, or resold 
for fifty six million dollars. That's just clear money laundering right there. I mean, that's open right. and shut. Okay, um, but the, uh, but he has uh, according to Craig Unger and uh, his book House of Trump, House of Putin. I've interviewed Craig a number of times and cited his work. And I've read his book a couple of times actually. Uh, Trump right. did about thirteen hundred real estate transactions with Russian oligarchs since the nineteen eighties. And you know, at one point he was uh, several billion, four to six billion dollars in debt and uh, facing. Um, numerous bankruptcies, and then suddenly he's flinging cash all over Fifth Avenue. And as best we can tell, uh, the, his flagship Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan is essentially a dormitory for Russian oligarchs. So uh, th- there is a, and of course all the oligarchs in Russia are tied in one way or another, or under the thumb in one way or another, of Vladimir Putin. So um, where do you think the um, dovetailing is? between Trump's financial dealings with the Putin-controlled oligarchs and his, say, foreign and domestic policies. Well, what I think, and what the federal prosecutors are prepared to, 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 to file, may be two different things. What I think is that if, in fact, he was remunerated, and, in fact, he took actions that he knew to be contrary to U.S. national security and the best interest of the United States of America— in his capacity as president of the United States, with the aid, assistance, and remuneration of a hostile foreign power, then he has committed espionage. Yes. Um, okay. So and then, docu- there is a line. filing that, filing that, and documenting it in a court of law is a is a higher is a higher threshold. Right now, there is one instance of treason that we have had certainly of a president of the United States. Uh, since uh, World War II, although he wasn't exactly, he wasn't quite president at the time. But Richard Nixon in 1968 was the right. uh, Republican nominee for president of the United States. And we have, without a doubt, this is not, this is no longer conspiracy theory. This is conspiracy fact. We know that he ordered his uh, liaison to the South Vietnamese government, uh, Madame Chenault, uh, the wife of the founder of the Flying Tigers, uh, to call the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, and tell them to not sign a peace deal with Lyndon Johnson. And Lyndon Johnson himself referred to that as treason. I think he has case, frankly. Uh, why Lyndon Johnson never made that public uh, is beyond me at this point. But uh, we know it happened. Do you think that Donald Trump has done anything to um, uh, on that level? Well, let me put it this way. I'm not sure that necessarily meets the um, constitutional definition of treason. But I understand where you're going, and I, and I certainly saw that wonderful uh, documentary that was produced by MSNBC with a uh, narration by Rachel Maddow. Um, I think she did a great job. Um, I, there are really three instances that I'm aware of that could rise to the level of treason or that t- form of treason. I, I want to be careful here. Um, uh, treasonous conduct, and I'm going to use treasonous as a, um, as a as a descriptive of treason, not necessarily formal treason. Formal treason, again, is a very, very narrow statute. It's easy to search out on the Internet, and I advise everyone to do that. Uh, but there are really three instances that really fell into that particular genre. Um, Richard Nixon was, in my, to the best of my knowledge, the first to cross and speak and it's at a time of war to speak to uh, a hostile power and try and, you know, att- uh, manipulate uh, events to his political advantage. The next was Ronald Reagan negotiating uh, with the Iranians who were holding American hostages, not to release the hostages so he could win the election. Yikes. Okay, that's yeah, really I'll, bad. I'll agree with that. That's the October That's surprise. Really bad. <laughs> then you've got Donald <laughs> Trump collaborating, and I believe he did collaborate with Vladimir Putin um, uh, and the Russians uh, and um, Julian Assange uh, to release to his advantage the stolen emails and help coordinate an illicit campaign of promotion for his presidency. Um, I don't think it was as bad as what Ronald Reagan did. I don't think it's as bad as what um, 
Richard Nixon did. But it's bad. Uh, well, and I think it, we're, falls, we're, we're, it falls into the yeah. same genre, certainly. Wow. We're talking with Mark Ash, the uh, editor and publisher of Reader Supported News. Um, he's had uh, many pieces on there. His most recent one, I believe, is espionage is not out of the question. And, 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 you know, it struck me when I first read it that you did avoid the T word, uh, the treason word, which I've used numerous times. And, you know, I remember being accused of being a conspiracy theorist when we, when we put out the idea that Nixon had interfered with the peace talks. I did a lot of, in 1968, I did a lot of work on the October surprise. And, um, you know, it wasn't so much Reagan personally. I would bet you that they kept Reagan out of the loop on that one, but it was George H.W. Bush and William Casey who very clearly, to my mind, negotiated with the Iranians to keep the hostages in Iran uh, during the 1980 presidential campaign. Uh, to my mind, there's very little doubt about that, although we don't have a smoking gun uh, to the equivalent of what we have of, from 1968. 1968, we have actual tapes of phone conversations between Nixon and uh, Madame Chenault, and then between Madame Chenault and the Vietnamese. So there's no doubt about that one. Uh, we're really, I'd say we're 95% there on the October surprise with Trump and uh, the, the, uh, the, the presidential campaign. Uh, I think we're getting awful close, and it's awful quick. I mean, it took a long, long time for the stuff about Nixon and 68 to come out. We're still fighting to um, uh, c- confirm <clears throat> the October surprise in 1980. We're only two years out from the 2016 election. That's pretty quick and something of this magnitude. Absolutely. And, and, and I, you know, I'm having arguments with people about Mueller. I have to say, I, I think, and I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your opinion on this, I think Mueller is actually the real deal. I mean, uh, he, he, I'm, I don't know how many um, uh, indictments and convictions he's racked up, but it's a pretty uh, formidable uh, uh, death toll here, and he doesn't show any signs of slowing down. Uh, what do you think of Mueller? Well, I think Bob Mueller is exactly what he appears to be. Um, he's a hard-nosed prosecutor, and he's somebody that doesn't back off. He's referred to many by people that know him and people that work with him um, as a um, uh, uh, as a prosecutorial assassin. <laughs> he's not. Wow. He's not considered. I like that. He's not considered to be the nicest guy. <laughs> um, he basically. If they want you in prison, he comes from a genre, uh, a, 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 a mindset of federal prosecutors and law enforcement officials who, if they want you in prison, they'll get you there. If they right. can't get you one way, they'll get you another. And he'll get who he's after here. And I'll be, I believe he's after Donald Trump, and I believe he'll get him. Um, you mean after all, the, after all the nice things that Trump has said about Bob Mueller? Uh, well, it's not just about Bob Mueller. First of all, he railroaded several, several – Donald Trump railroaded several major high-ranking Justice Department officials, one of which was Jim Comey, who was, by the way, not a, a big fan favorite of mine. But at the end of the day, he was railroaded. He was the director of the FBI. And, he, and Donald Trump was doing that to undermine the rule of law and convert the role of, of uh, rule of law to his own, his own process for his own benefit. But there was also James Baker, who was the, the uh, ch- uh, lead counsel for the FBI, um, chief counsel for the FBI. Uh, Peter Strzok was another one that got railroaded. I mean, they really laid a lot of these guys out. That really isn't going to sit well. And if they have something they can get Donald Trump on, they're going to get him. <laughs> I'll tell you right now. Again, bear in mind, um, Bob Mueller's not... He hasn't made friends. Not everybody loves Bob Mueller. Um, John Kiriakou, who was railroaded by, by the Justice Department, was primarily one of the key players in that, in that, that prosecution, was Bob Mueller. In fact, John Kiriakou was arrested by Peter Strzok. Oh, my God. He was, basically, he was, he was railroaded on trumped-up charges. So it's still the FBI that we know and love over the years, right? We know who they are. Yeah. 
But in this particular no, instance, quick, Donald uh, Trump at this point is trying to destroy federal law enforcement to protect his own ass, just like he was Don Trump Leone. Yes. So okay? I want to say real that quick needs about John to, That needs to stop. John Kiriakou has had stuff published that Reader Supported oh, News. Tell us real quick who he is. Remind our, our listeners who he is. John Kiriakou was a CIA agent. He was an expert in counterterrorism. Um, he worked directly under the supervision of, of then Secretary of State John Kerry. Um, he was a key, one of the best regarded and best respected counterterrorism uh, officers the CIA had. Um, he became concerned about what was going on uh, with torture. He had complained to his supervisors that he thought that the policies surrounding torture and the execution of those policies by federal law enforcement agents, including CIA agents, was probably unlawful, and he was deeply concerned about it. He expressed those concerns to his superiors, um, and through a series of confrontations, he came to a point where he believed that he was going to be a, he was going to get, he thought he was going to get railroaded. So he went. And he did. He went on. He did get railroaded. He went on a national broadcast with uh, Brian Ross from ABC News. And he said some things that um, didn't set well. <clears throat> Wow. And, uh, and and they proceeded to rail- railroad him. Um, and and one of the guys that was involved there was John Brennan, at the, uh, who was the, uh, then the director of the CIA. Um, Robert Mueller was was involved. Uh, it was not pretty. And it was. And he was in prison uh, for almost. Kiriakou was in prison for what? A couple of years. Nearly four years. Oh my God. God, that's awful. We're talking with Mark Ash, the uh, publisher and editor of Reader Supported News. We're awaiting uh, uh, Medea Benjamin. Medea, are you on with us? Yes, I am. Hi, Harvey. Oh, you're here. Okay, good to have you here. So uh, you and Mark uh, are uh, acquainted with each other. Uh, Mark's been, uh, and I've been talking about the uh, Trump apocalypse here, or, or what I call Trump exit. I am, by the way, predicting that Donald Trump will be gone by April 22nd. I just put $10 into a party pool um, uh, over the weekend, so we'll see if I win. <clears throat> Medea, you are uh, one of the great activists of our generation. You are a co-founder of Code Pink. You have been involved in peace, uh, women's rights, and so many other issues over the years. Um, uh, Mark's going to stick with us, and I want to ask you very specifically, this is a huge uh, a couple of uh, events that have happened on issues that, at which you are uh, uh, center stage. Um, uh, Trump has now announced uh, that he wants to pull troops out of Syria. And in, mo- far more important to me, in my mind, is that the, U- the Congress, the Senate, has voted with uh, a Republican majority to um, uh, no longer fund uh, the Syrian presence in Yemen. And to me, this is important, A, because uh, it indicates a... Um, uh, a crack in the in the stone wall of the Republican support for Donald Trump, and also maybe even more important in the long term, a possible crack in our imperial stone wall. Uh, uh, Medea, as only you can, uh, tell us, please, what you think about this. Well, it's not uh, as broad as you said. It's to stop the U.S. support for the Saudi-led war in Yemen. It doesn't call for an end to the weapon sales, which I think should be the next thing on the agenda, but it does call for the U.S. to stop providing the uh, refueling of the planes, the logistical support, the um, uh, maintenance of the the weapons, and uh, all else that would be considered part of aiding the, quote, hostilities in Yemen. And it's uh, very important because of the message it sends. It's also very important because it is the first time since 
1973 enactment of the War Powers Act, that the War Powers have actually been uh, used to assert Congress's authority. So it's, uh, and we've already seen the effect, even though it will be reintroduced in the House and the Senate in January, past the Senate in December, uh, we already see the impact of it because the Saudis see the writing on the wall and they have been uh, more amenable to the talks that just took place in Sweden to try to find ways to uh, uh, get a negotiated solution uh, in the long term and in the short term at least guarantee that humanitarian aid would be able to um, get through the main port of Hudaida. So all of that is extremely important. Uh, I, I think it's mind-boggling, actually, and it's uh, something that uh, Code Pink deserves a lot of credit for. You, you uh, have been campaigning on issues like this for a long time. Uh, how much of this um, vote, uh, uh, you can consider it to a certain extent an anti-Saudi vote, how much of it do you think had to do with the uh, butchery of Jamal Khashoggi? There was already a lot of momentum before Khashoggi's death uh, to uh, invoke the War Powers Act, and then there were uh, some votes that were related to cutting off certain precision munitions to the Saudis that were being used in Yemen, and uh, the Senate came close to passing those. Uh, so Khashoggi put it over the edge. It brought in a number um, of Republicans who weren't with us on this issue before. Uh, so it's been important, but the numbers have uh, kept increasing uh, pretty much with each vote. And with the greater media um, coverage of the catastrophe in Yemen, I would say in the last six months, the American public has started to see the results of the Saudi bombing with U.S. help. In fact, there were even reports by CNN that we had never seen in the mainstream media before that actually looked at the markings on the bombs that were used, for example, the, to uh, kill over 40 school children when they crushed their bus and saying that these are Lockheed Martin and Raytheon bombs that were being used. So there was... Um, there has been more public attention paid to this issue, more opposition in general, and that together with the Khashoggi murder has really made this an issue that has enough support in both the House and the Senate to be passed when it's reintroduced in January. Well, in the shorter term now, a lot of us, you know, who are pulling for the uh, the Trump exit, the, the departure of Donald Trump, took this um, in the short term as an indication uh, that uh, there were, uh, if there were enough Republicans to break um, with him on this uh, vote to continue funding the Saudi uh, Holocaust in Yemen, that there might be enough, eventually enough Republican votes uh, to uh, remove him from office in an impeachment trial. Do you want to comment on that real quick, and then we'll go back to foreign policy? Well, just on the foreign policy, we don't know if there's enough votes to override a Trump veto uh, if we. Uh, do get it to his desk on this issue of the war powers resol resolution. So um, even there, we're not sure how many Republicans we can hold on to. And I think this is also probably related to Trump's uh, announcement of pulling out the troops from Syria. Uh, so uh, it, it's all related, and um, we don't know from day to day, week to week, month to month, uh, where this is leading. Well, what do you think then? Um, uh, of course, there's immediately uh, a lot of pushback on the, on the Syria vote is saying he's just doing it to, uh, uh, out of fealty uh, to Vladimir Putin, because it certainly serves Putin's interest. What do you, what do you say to that about the uh, pullout from, um, uh, from Syria? I don't know why he did it. There's others who say that it was to shore up his base since it was a promise that he made while campaigning. And certainly the polls show that there is no appetite among the American people to continue the U.S. involvement in the never-ending wars in Syria and the Middle East in general. Um, this You would not know this from hearing the uh, D.C. elite pundits on the liberal and the right side who have been uh, complaining tremendously about this move. 
but it really is one that is popular not only with Trump's base, but with the public in general. So the, here's the here's the big picture question. And Mark, Ash, you're welcome to join, jump in on this one. Can we uh, see a glimmer of any kind of hope here of Donald Trump, of all people, pulling our troops out of somewhere? I don't remember the United States pulling troops out of anywhere. Um, uh, you know, Obama allegedly pulled some out of um, uh, uh, Iraq, but and left them all in, in Afghanistan, for God's sakes. Um, is there any glimmer that this might be some kind of turning point in the, in the American imperial uh, presence in the world? Which is, of course, what Code Pink has been in the vanguard of working on for so long. Mark, did you well, want to come in, come in? Oh. Well, yeah, I think it's really difficult to say. He doesn't have a great deal of, he doesn't seem to have a great deal of credibility with the other key players <laughs> in the government that would have anything, really have anything to say. I mean, the Pentagon doesn't take him very seriously. Con- Congress, every time he really tries to do so, act with any kind of real authority, Congress seems to intercede and kind of create impediments for him to do that. So I, I really don't know that he's going to be able to move the equation one way or the other. Um, I, he probably, it would be fair to say that he hasn't, started any wars that have gotten a lot of people killed yet so i guess to that extent it's kind of nice but whether or not he's going uh, to be able to really move i mean you don't there are situations where you really don't want him to move foreign policy i mean the u.s the u.s relationship with nato over the years however productive of negative things and it has been productive of some negative things still and yet it's it's been the anchor uh, of the of the Western Democratic Alliance for decades, uh, you know he would. Well, he he seems to think he seems to like to would think that he'd like to undermine that. Yeah, that's true. Uh, uh, Medea, I, I would love to see I have that a, 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 undermining of NATO. I think NATO is a, uh, uh, a, a, a as Trump said in his campaigning. He said it was obsolete. It certainly, it certainly should be obsolete. Uh, it should have ended when the uh, World War II ended, and it should, uh, and it's causing more uh, potential conflicts in the world uh, with the uh, bringing in of countries closer and closer to Russia's border. It's been very antagonistic, and um, Trump is now only encouraging the countries uh, within NATO to spend more money on the. Uh, on their military, something that their own people have been opposing. Um, You ask the French people if they want to spend more money on the military? I don't think so. Uh, Ask uh, anybody in in Europe. So I think NATO is problematic, and I think it's problematic that Trump has embraced NATO. Uh, In fact, NATO will be coming and being hosted in Washington, D.C. in April, and many of us in the anti-war movement will be there to uh, oppose NATO. Well, I have a, I have a, an ulterior motive here. I'm, I'm about to publish my own history of the United States. It's the 40th anniversary upcoming of Howard Zinn's People's History, and so mine is kind of Howard's book on acid. And um, uh, uh, I would love to be able to say that uh, in 2019 or 2018, a corner was turned on the global empire when we uh, pulled out of Syria. Uh, is it way, way, way out of line to even begin to think that, Medea? I think it's too early to tell. I think the corner will be turned when uh, the U.S. pulls out of Afghanistan, because that has been now 17 years plus. Uh, Trump has talked about getting troops out of there, uh, but hasn't done it. I think if he does that, um, we can mark that as a milestone But 2,000 troops in Syria, while the U.S. continues to be involved in bombing campaigns in Syria, uh, we haven't seen yet if the troops are even getting pulled out. We don't know about special command uh, forces in Syria. I think it's too early to say that. Well, where do we stand in Iraq? Um, How many of our how many troops, uh, Medea, do we still have in Iraq? Is there any indication that anything Obama did was meaningful? in terms of pulling out of there? 
Well, there's about 5,000 troops left in Iraq. Uh, it was meaningful that the number of troops was reduced. Uh, that's positive. But the U.S. has really had a very difficult time in, uh, in Iraq because Iraq borders on Iran. Uh, there are many uh, Iraqis who have long-standing relationships with Iran that are both religious and political. The U.S. invasion took out a Sunni government and put a Shia one in. And so it's quite ironic that uh, after the U.S. toppled the government of Saddam Hussein, uh, it came to the uh, awareness that there's never going to be a government in Iraq um, that really doesn't have some Iranian influence in it. And this has been hard for the U.S. to swallow. Yeah, it's amazing, you know, uh, and, and of course, the attack on Libya uh, uh, wound up opening the floodgates uh, of immigration into, or, or, you know, refugees into Europe. Uh, it's always the law of unintended consequences. Uh, uh, Medea, you've been campaigning for peace uh, for so long. Um, uh, wh- how do you feel uh, that your efforts have uh, uh, impacted us, and where do you think we're heading? Well, I think that we, in the broad sense, as a much larger movement, um, have been able to stave off a war with Iran, and I hope that despite uh, the Bush love affair with Israel and Saudi Arabia, both of whom would love the U.S. to uh, get involved in a military conflict in Iran, we're, uh, we're able to keep that off the table. And uh, I think... It, it will be time with the new members of Congress and um, people like Bernie Sanders who are starting to bring it up more, uh, addressing the issue of the staggering uh, budget for the Pentagon and how this impedes all of the positive things that many people are calling for, whether it's the Green New Deal or the um, Medicare for All uh, we need to look at the biggest pot of money there is, and that's the Pentagon budget. And this is something that Donald Trump has been back and forth about, saying that it was crazy how large it is and then proposing uh, more increases. So I think that's something that we have to come together on in the different movements to really understand the need to rein in the Pentagon budget and liberate funds that we so desperately need for uh, good things. Do you see uh, an evolution? This is, uh, you know, something that popped into my head a while ago that there might be a, actually a peace caucus in in the uh, Congress. Well, that's a great idea, given that there is an F thirty five caucus and a drone caucus and a caucus for all these different weapons. Um, you would think that the progressive caucus would be a peace caucus, but it really isn't. So I think that's a great idea. Well, it occurred to me, and this is being a historian. This is my this was my pipe dream that that Barbara Lee would chair a peace caucus, and it would be the Rankin Lee Peace Caucus because you know Jeanette Rankin and Barbara Lee in the history of the United States Congress are the only two people to cast a solitary vote for peace. Uh, Jeanette Rankin, of course, uh, was elected to Congress in 1916 and uh, was one of fifty. Um, uh, Congress people to vote against World War I. Um, and she, of course, was the only liberal woman. She was the first woman elected to Congress. And then she came back to Congress in 1940 and was the only member of either House of Congress to vote against the uh, declaration of war in World War II. And then Barbara Lee, of course, cast her sole vote for peace. I would, I would love to see a, a women's peace caucus um, or, or non-exclusive peace caucus in the, in the Congress. I think it's way overdue. Um, uh, Mark Ash, do you want to comment on that? Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I go back to Dennis Kucinich and I go back to his efforts um, for so long in Congress. There really haven't been very many members of Congress that were really outspoken uh, about um, Defining a peace initiative, defining initiatives that would enhance the chances for peace long term. There really have been very, yes. very few. Um, well, our peace I guess Ron Dellum was pretty good. good. Uh, yes. Same seat uh, obviously, Barbara Dennis Kucinich was good. Well, well we have Paul Pink, which has been our 
Code Pink has been our de facto peace council caucus in the country, and it's been very, very effective. And, Medea, we certainly want to thank you for your increased efforts here. Um, do you see any? Do you see more Republicans uh, breaking with Trump on, on issues like this? I mean, you've been instrumental in getting at least some to break on this uh, Syria war. Uh, were there any more that you could foresee coming over? Well, we saw people that you would never have thought would come over uh, uh, on the issue of um, uh, curtailing U.S. support to Saudi Arabia, and those are people like uh, Lindsey Graham and uh, Senator Corker and Marco Rubio. I mean, who would have ever thought? Uh, but they were very upset by the Khashoggi incident. Their hearts were not um, uh, were not uh, softened by the pictures of the dying children. Uh, but the murder of a Washington Post journalist really did get to them. I don't think that we can count them on our side for very much. It's been very hard to get significant numbers of Republicans, other than Rand Paul and Mike Lee from Utah. Uh, it's hard to get them consistently to oppose the, um, the, the war agenda. And, of course, um, as you know well, Harvey, if you do a little correlation between the, um, the contributions to their campaigns from the weapons com- companies, the Israel lobby, the Saudi lobby. Uh, it will give your listeners an indication of why they continue to support wars that are so unpopular with the American people. But I do have a lot of hope uh, with the incoming Congress that we will get some real champions uh, who we can work with to to think outside the box and uh, introduce uh, new measures that would really be very visionary in terms of um, how we could move away from wars and into a foreign policy that really focuses on diplomacy, not just in words, but in deeds. Well, that will segue us into the Green New Deal. Uh, Jody Evans, have you come on yet? Uh, Jody's not with us yet. She's scheduled to come in at 40. Hi, Harvey, I'm here. Medea. Oh, you are here. Jody Evans, you're with yeah. us? Yeah, I'm here. Excellent. Okay, so, uh, Medea, I know you, you, uh, you may have to go. You're welcome to stay on if you like and continue with Mark Ash as well. Uh, but we're joined by Jody Evans, the other co-founder of Code Pink, and we're going to segue a little bit away from uh, our foreign policy discussion to the Green New Deal. Great. I'll just say and, uh, thank you, Harvey and, and Mark, and um, uh Thank you for the uh, the time on, on your show and to talk about these critical issues. Well, thank you, uh, Medea, for your years of uh, dedicated, hard, and very effective work. And it's an honor to have you on the show, as it is to have uh, Jody Evans. So, Jody, uh, you're talking to us from Southern California, I believe. Um, Mark is in Northern California, so we're now on all California show here. Um, um, with the Green New Deal is uh, getting a lot of play now, and uh, Alexandria Ortiz, Ortazio-Cortez is, is coming in with it. Um, it's a, in the form, some kind of resolution at this point, there's a lot of talk about uh, forming a caucus in the uh, Congress, uh, even a committee uh, in the House to deal with the Green New Deal. And I want to make sure that um, we start uh, uh, with you and, and tell us what you're thinking about the Green New Deal and, and where you think it might go. Oh, and we're very excited about the possibility of a Green New Deal. And, you know, the Green Party has been carrying one for quite a while, and now that it's being picked up by um, Alexandria and others, it's very exciting because their leadership is fresh and it's just kind of blowing down the opposition. Um, we've just, uh, you know, asked them to consider including... Uh, U.S. military as an environmentally destructive force um, and that enormous budget, which is over 60 percent of our taxes in discretionary spending, and move it over to how we would have the revenue for some of the green initiatives that they're proposing. Um, So we have a petition on our our website um, calling on them to include the bloated military budget as a source of revenue and also ending the environmental impact of militarism. Well, that's a, a, a great thing. Um, and, uh, of course, the, the term New Deal harkens back to uh, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. You know, Eleanor is ne- never sufficiently mentioned in discussing the original New Deal, but it was really Eleanor 
who was the architect of, of a lot of it, uh, she gave Franklin uh, at least one memo a day and wrote a national column every day. I mean, as a writer, Mark, you and I uh, would know what a taxing job that would be uh, for someone to be first lady of the United States do all she did and put out a column every day that was syndicated in virtually all the com- uh, newspapers in the country. I do have a pet um, um, issue, and I, I want to raise it here with you, Jody, and Mark, about the Green New Deal, which is the uh, need to avoid uh, nuclear power in the Green New Deal. I've always, I'm, having been in that movement for more than 40 years, inevitably you see uh, the interests of the nuclear power industry trying to sneak their way in. And um, uh, I did send a query to the Sunshine Movement about uh, shutting nuclear plants, and they have uh, come back. The, the response I got was that they do not support new nuclear plants, but they do uh, also not support shutting nuclear plants if those plants are going to be um, replaced with um, uh, fossil fuels. And I, I want to make it clear of my position, which is that uh, any nuclear plant that's shut uh, should be part of the deal is they should be immediately replaced by fossil fuels. Those of us in California are all too familiar with the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plants where Pacific Gas and Electric has conceded that those two reactors could be shut uh, and replaced entirely with renewables right now. Uh, what are, uh, Jody, what are the other aspects of the Green New Deal that are uh, most important to you? Well, I mean, also that we should remember that this is about creating a coalition to do this work, so we don't know what it is, and, and it's great that we continue to bring up some of the pieces that we want to make sure are, are brought into it because I'm sure it's going to be a major lobbying effort and hopefully bring a lot of people into the conversation. And just a reminder that we don't have enough conversations about what's happening in our country and how we can participate and how we can learn. And just the fact that this opens up the dialogue, that it allows people to talk about what is possible and what can happen, part of what I feel is that it could open us up to all kinds of things that have been shut down and, and um, allow us to think even bigger. Because you well, know, uh, we see this in, in the anti-war movement, that the conversation becomes very narrowed by false choices and um, by having this Green New Deal where it is a conversation where it's going to be de- debate and dialogue just allows us to talk about things that aren't talked about, that are shut out of Congress and out of debate. To me, that's going to be one of the most important parts. So, um, uh, well, well, the original New Deal uh, included, of course, a tremendous amount of work programs. The CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps, for example, uh, built uh, trails uh, and and, uh, uh, other facets in the national park system, uh, uh, there was uh, the Works Progress Administration, the Public Works Administration that did, there was a lot of art, uh, uh, you know, murals and, and uh, programs and schools. There was a lot of school building. And, of course, um, the centerpiece, as best I can tell, and certainly in my own particular interest, is the conversion to renewable energy. Uh, uh, where do you see that playing out? Uh, what, what do you see as the principal tangible accomplishments that we're looking for uh, once we get our coalitions together. Jody Evans. Oh, definitely moving to a green economy. And those you know, many uh, paths are, are laid for that to be possible and um, and to be exposed. Um, there, there are, um, I, I've just been reading that the cost of Creating um, green energy has gone down tremendously. Um, I was part of Jerry Brown's um, cabinet when he was first governor, and the Office of Appropriate Technology was um, under my office, and that's where um, wind energy and solar energy uh, were able to be funded and and founded because uh, they got tax breaks. And you look at what it was then and what it is now, the capacity. I mean, you've moved the numbers down to where the arguments are that this is the economic way to go. We see that in the divest movement, that, you know, when in the divest from fossil fuel movement, that that's where 
the money is. It's where um, the gains are happening. And, um, again, it's going to be where we're, we're going to be able to look and see what's really been hiding in plain sight. That is what's exciting. Because all this is happening. Uh, Mark Ash, do you want to jump in, uh, editor and publisher of Reader Support News? Well, I think Jody's doing a really good job. She has a really deep understanding of this issue. Uh, you know, a green economy is something that we've struggled for for a long time. Um, it's been it's, it's faced a lot of resistance. When you start talking about a green economy, you start shifting, talking about shifting a good deal of revenue uh, from traditional energy producers. And when you see Donald Trump, you know, rolling around the countryside extolling the virtues of coal, uh, you get a clear picture of how how difficult reversing the economic realities of a fossil fuel economy can be. You're taking money out of the pockets of, of people who don't want money taken out of their pockets. And they, they, can, be, they can be difficult to deal with. And they can always right. find somebody like Donald Trump who will, who will basically promote their, their agenda. And, and many of those individuals uh, exist within the Democratic Party. That's a very good uh, point. We also have and, you know, people uh, that are suffering climate change, and that number is growing. So, you know, there's new coalitions that will be formed around this um, where the losses are real. It's not something they talk about anymore. It's something people are experiencing. And it's pretty devastating, and the activism that's happening out of some of these communities is, is going to surprise people. Yes, and the really good news is, um, uh, you know, when we first started fighting nuclear power back in the 70s, uh, people asked us what we were going to replace it with, and we sort of just uh, kind of pulled out of the air, wind and solar. We really didn't. They sounded good. We didn't know anything about them. And it's been really one of the great technological miracles of the last 50 years that wind and solar have absolutely blown away all um, uh, previous uh, prognostications. I mean, it is cheaper now to shut a nuclear plant, build a wind farm, and operate it than it is to continue to operate the nuclear plant. And uh, the, the same with solar. And as you pointed out, Mark, a lot of this has to do with who gets the money. Uh, the beauty of solar, especially rooftop solar, is that it shifts the resources from the corporations uh, to the individual homeowners and apartment dwellers. And, and it's a really a decentralizing, uh, democratizing uh, technological transformation. And that's, I think, Jody, as we move ahead uh, and fighting for the New Deal, that's going to be uh, the core of the pushback is going to be corporate. Because when we talk about a Green New Deal that has a centerpiece of wind and solar, and especially rooftop solar, we're talking about a massive redistribution of wealth and of power. Well, so a few years ago, uh, during the Obama administration, one of the things we looked at as we had been trying to end war for many years was that we're not going to end the war until we end the war economy. And so a lot of, you know, our local work at Code Pink is in how do we create local peace economies and getting, you know, getting things like locally owned, locally connected um, energy uh, taking it back, taking it smaller. And so I want to say that also this, these technologies work for getting off grids, getting, getting you know, out of the ownership of major corporations and being able to do it ourselves. And with global climate change and uh, global inequality and for, uh, $1.4 trillion of weapons sold each year, you know, that level of instability means that we do need to start remembering what it is to live in peace and to take care of each other and to learn what it is to create and grow local peace. Oh, my God. Jody, you are wonderful. Thank was you so much, Jody Evans. Co- co- Pink, Mark Ash, from Reader Supported News. This has been Harvey Sluggo Washington at uh, the Sortopia Green Power and Wellness Hour. We'll be back next week. Thank you both. And Medea Benjamin as well. Thank you so much. We're gonna have a solar-topia, solar-topia, solar-topia.